welcome to another Fikava Vet Chat. The person I'd like to meet today is uh, Belgian Professor Hans Nauving. He's a, a professor in virology, uh, oh, sorry, he's a veterinary surgeon and uh, a professor at the Department of Virology at the University of Ghent. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I had a little bit of a look in your bio before um, we had our vet chat and I saw that we we both qualified uh, sort of at the end of the 80s. So yes, I yes went we're, old, in, we're getting old. <laughs> yeah, I went I went into a clinical first opinion practice. Yeah. So, but you went into high end uh, um, a virology in research. What made you decide uh, to go into infectious diseases and specifically virology? Yes. I was uh, in the beginning. I was always thinking on uh, being a cl clinician. You know, I wanted to, especially horses. Uh, I liked horses, and I was planning with another vet to start a, a, cl a clinic, uh, one of the first group clinic in uh, clinics in in Belgium. But uh, at a certain moment, I was combining. During the day, I was working in, in the lab, and during the night, I was working as a vet. Uh, and in the beginning, the the vet part was always the the best and I liked it and the, the lab work was not that that sexy I would say but uh, you know it it turned so uh, the longer I was in, in the field I, I felt not very comfortable on diagnostics uh, I, I because 50 or more percent of the the cases I had were not diagnosed and I ju was just treating 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 but I didn't know what it was so I, I could not live with that so I had uh, uh, you know I could not sleep by that, so um, I was not very co comfortable with that. And and then uh, during the day, I was uh, working in the lab, and there that was the opposite. In the beginning, uh, I didn't feel comfortable, but uh, I was very good in uh, setting up the protocols and, and doing the research, and I was so uh, happy with the results. So you, you really could 100% control what you were doing, and you could always get an answer to your to your questions. So I, I was turning from a, let's say, a, a, a real clinician into a, 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 a top virologist, uh, let's say in one year. And uh, at the end, I didn't want to, I, even now, I don't want to go back. So um, I'm very happy with, uh, with, with what, what I'm doing. And every day is a, 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 a challenging new day that I can, uh, you know, jump in and uh, try to find new things. So um, I'm really, really happy with my decision I made uh, in the very beginning. That's, I mean, for somebody like me who is in first opinion practice, it's always nice if you work together with a specialist who has also seen the shop floor, who, who has done clinical practice and who knows, I mean, what are the, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 the problems that we are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes so that they that that clients come to us, they don't necessarily need to to have the very first news, but they would like to have results explained, or they want to have guidance with with complex scientific issues. Mm -hmm. I saw that you are not only um, researching um, virus infections, infectious diseases in the usual domestic species, but you are also working with shellfish. Yes. Shrimps. So, what what are you doing there? Well, um, um, my my old boss always asked me, Hans, which animal do you like? And I, I always had to answer, you know, I don't care about the animal. I said, I'm I'm always interested in in new in in new pathogenesis work, and I don't care what the animal is, and I really mean it. So, if it was uh, feline infectious peritonitis in cats or or uh, equine herpes virus one infections in horses. I was only interested in, in difficult pathogenesis work. And um, at a certain moment, I, was, I, I, I had enough of all those mammals and the mammal-like stuff. And uh, I wanted to have a, a new challenge. And there was a, a bioengineer coming to our lab. Uh, Patrick Sorlos is his name. And he was a, a world-famous guy in, in, uh, in uh, aquaculture. And he said uh, to, to, to me, he said, Hans, you know, you have to do really something about all those diseases in in shrimp uh, nobody is able to do it and we need a vet with some brilliant ideas to look to those animals and he said well, why why don't you do it and i was you know i was starkly convinced so i started to work in in shrimp and this animal uh, is that was the worst case scenario that you could ever have that is you know uh, 
whatever you were thinking that should work did not work in shrimp. So um, just the, the, the simple question was, how do you infect a shrimp? Uh, this was such a simple question. Of course, as a vet, you would say you, you, you peroral, uh, or you you uh, in in the you you put it in the lungs or in the nose or you know uh, and that will work. With, with that animal, uh, nothing worked. So uh, we we ended up with uh, no results. So we were intubating those uh, shrimp. We were uh, putting them. We immersed them in fluid full of virus. We'd ever th we did everything, but nothing worked. So that was a kind of a big frustration. I, I was working on that for, uh, let's say, 10 years. And uh, I had then a Vietnamese student, a very smart one. And uh, I remember the, the day he was sitting here in front of me, uh, uh, to totally uh, disappointed about the research and frustrated. And, he, and, and I asked him, I said, God damn it, I said, uh, Tuong was his name. I said, Tuong, how is it possible? I said, that we cannot infect those animals. I said, those animals are covered with the, the cuticula, eh? the outer plastic, I call it, but also inside, they're fully covered with plastic. I said, you know, is there a, a, a place in the animal where, where the virus could enter? And I said, it should be a place that has no cuticula. Mm -hmm. And then he started to think and he said, uh, yes, he said, he said, uh, the antenna gland. I said, the antenna gland, uh, I said, uh, what is that? And then he started to talk about it. And it turned out, after a lot of research, it turned out to be the kidney which is in, uh, in a shrimp, not uh, in the back of the animal, but in the front, in the head. So most, when you see the, 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 the head part of a shrimp, that's uh, almost full uh, kidney stuff. And we found out that, uh, you know, you have kidneys and bladders, and this is very similar to mammals, but then you have a full network of bags, the verticals, you know, uh, bags. And uh, that was, we found out that we could inoculate those anim anim animals uh, through the, the nephropore, the opening, and we could really infect those animals through that way. And we discovered also that all those bags uh, are not only the place where, where viruses and bacteria can start to replicate, but also they're very important for, for the growth of the shrimp. So the, the, the shrimp can uh, fill their bags, and by doing that, they can uh, increase their volume and they get, can get out of their cuticula because they have to molt every nine to 13 days so we've just by looking to the virus, we got totally on another track. So we, we discovered how shrimp are growing. Uh, so these are just, I would say, fun of your life, you know, uh, working with other uh, species. It's, it's, I can it's talk not, about that for, 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 for 10 days, but we don't have I can, for that. Uh, I, see, I see that. Well, that's, yeah, fascinating. That's a uh, yeah, completely different sort of... Uh, um, uh, subject, yeah. But never that we want to talk a little bit about, well, we want to uh, talk about COVID. Um, uh, uh, you're a very much sought after person, not only in Belgium, but also uh, in Brussels at the European Union because of your knowledge on COVID, especially when we look at uh, zoonotic aspects of uh, the condition. There was in um, April, the uh, case of the uh, cats that ha was tested uh, positive for SARS-CoV-2 uh, at the University of Liege. Um, and then obviously a lot of uh, 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 people went to you for, for further advice. Um, where would you say do we stand now with uh, our domestic animals, especially as veterinary surgeons, yes. uh, dogs, cats, the animals we usually see in practice? Yes, I, th I think we should make, because you know we have, the cats are of course extremely important targets. When you look to the uh, uh, experimental inoculations that they did uh, in some uh, uh, institutes, then we know that cats are, are, are sensitive. Uh, so cats are uh, animals that you should look at and that you should take differential diagnosis uh, the SARS-CoV-2. However, it's not explosive in cats. So it's not like we see in, uh, in, uh, in humans. It's, it's not spreading extremely well. And they're not that uh, susceptible because I, we're doing here with a new technology some uh, screening in cats. And I only had one uh, cat up to, let's say, uh, um, I think we tested 30 or 40 of some animals that you know people were thinking they had uh, uh, COVID-19, but afterwards it turned out to be stupid, uh, you know, a feline herpes virus one or or a, a Kalishi virus, all the the old enemies and not the uh, not not the SARS-CoV-2. 
So we only had one cat and there was a cat that was living together with a lot of uh, elder people and they, they had been positive, those, those people. And then we saw, serologically, we saw that, uh, you know, that animal had been uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. But there are only, you know, not a lot of cases in, uh, in, in, in Flanders because that's the only uh, region that, I'm, uh, that I can talk about. So cats are possible, but let's say we should you know, uh, exaggerate. And I didn't have a kind of a, a single of a diseased cat that afterwards turned out to be positive for SARS-CoV-2. We found one positive without symptoms, uh, serologically, but not uh, with disease. So I think uh, cats will not demonstrate. So to infect them, it's already rare. And then to get them diseased, I, I'm not aware of one. So I think it's not that easy for a cat to be infected. Uh, that's number one. If you talk about another uh, animal like uh, minks, uh, minks are extremely susceptible. And this is a dangerous thing. And, and, and this is quite surprising me because the first case in the Netherlands was, uh, you know, that was already an explosion. Eh? Mm. And, if, and if you see nowadays in, in, in Denmark, uh, you know, they keep their, there are a lot of uh, minks for, for, the, for the fur, fur industry. Well, there are a lot of positives. So uh, in Belgium, we don't have a huge industry. I think in the UK, it's, it's forbidden, I think. But in Belgium, we still have a few of them and they are negative. But, but once you, they're, they're infected, it's spreading like hell. It's also causing disease in those mink. Mm. So, uh, I have a kind of a feeling that maybe, uh, you know, they're always uh, thinking on how, how did the, the virus jump from, uh, from bats into humans? So everybody was looking to the, let's say, the, the, the animal in between. Uh, I always say there, there, it could be that there was no, no inter, in, intermediate animal in between the, the bats and humans. So it could be that it had a direct jump, which, which is most probably. But it could also be that maybe um, minks also play a role or, or uh, animals from the same family because it's a, they call it the mustelidae. So that's a huge family. Also a lot of animals in the wild. So I think it, you know, it's too sensitive. So I, I think the, 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 the people should look into that uh, in China, if there are also some, uh, you know, animals uh, infected, there are a lot of uh, animals kept for the fur in, in China. That's the biggest country for fur production. So I, I'm a believer also that they didn't mention it, but I'm a believer that also their uh, mink fur industry should have a look if there's nothing circulating down there. So, uh, um, so, so minks are extremely sensitive, just like ferrets, because they, ferrets are also... Uh, belonging to the Mustelidae, uh, and they have been shown also experimentally that they are also uh, highly susceptible. Uh, I didn't have also because in Belgium we don't have a lot of ferrets as pets. I don't know how how the situation is in the UK. I think that's uh, it's a very common species in small animal practice. Yes. Yeah. So I think I think uh, if there is disease in ferrets, I think that would be good to test those animals. If uh, I think ferrets, I would put ferrets on top of the cats at this moment. Um, uh, mink disease uh, also predominantly a respiratory symptomatic, or um, how are they affected? It's respiratory, but there is also some uh, some intestinal uh, issues uh, down there. So they always say whenever you have some disease in minks, whatever it is, just let let it test it. That's now the yeah. the advice that they give. With a cat in Liège, they um, isolated the um, virus particles uh, through a PCR in a fecal sample. Would that be also the, the route to take in a ferret? Yes. So um, I, I always uh, gave the advice to take both uh, a nasal swab and, and a fecal swab. But uh, it, it's just also uh, because this has been demonstrated also in animals that the, the, the primary application is mainly in the respiratory tract. So, that would be my, uh, so for sure, nasal swab. You can always uh, take also the, 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 the fecal swab. Uh, it doesn't, it's not because, because it's PCR. It's not because a fecal swab is positive that it means that you have infectious virus. Eh? So we have to be very careful with the technologies always uh, because that was also my, my warning to the people that found the virus in, in the feces in the cat. Uh, they went extremely fast in, uh, you know, uh, warning the whole world. Um, I think it's always good to warn the world, but I think as a virologist, you should also know that a uh, virus can be uh, ingested uh, and it's very well possible that the material still comes out as genetics in the feces. So that, 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 that was, uh, you know, um, 
that's why in the beginning I was very septic. But uh, but at, at let's say at the end, when they have proven it for several days and so on and so on, and then they did also some uh, infectivity studies. So at the end, and also serology, for me that was the most important one. Uh, so the serology became positive, then uh, there's no doubt that the animal was, was infected. So that was uh, one of the first cases. So, um, and that was a, a cat living together with a, a COVID-19 uh, patient. So uh, that was very logical, yeah. Um, uh, what's your take on uh, the use of veterinary expect uh, expertise in the current pandemic? There is obviously the, the philosophy of One Health, but it struck me at times that maybe um, veterinary knowledge was underused. Uh, what, what do you think? Well, for instance, the, the whole discussion on vaccines uh, is, is extremely weird to me. So um, I'm working already in my whole life with different viruses and different animals. And uh, we, we know, uh, for instance, for coronaviruses, especially the re respiratory coronavirus, this should be under control by vaccines. So the, the, the fact that people were talking, yeah, you can get two times, uh, you know, can you can be infected two times. For them, it's a surprise. For me, it's not a surprise. Uh, so if, if you have a, a local immunity after one infection, a local immunity will protect for four to six months. This is generally known. So that you can be reinfected after four to six months, that's, that's not something special. This is normal. Um, what, what, is, uh, uh, what will happen is you will have only replication in the nose, but you will not have a, a full replication in the lungs anymore because the lungs will be protected by the general immunity that, that is, has been raised. So for me, it looks like that they, didn't, they don't know extremely well what the pathogenesis is, and especially what we can expect from uh, the immune responses. And I was very surprised, and then I'm proud that I'm a vet, because as vets, we really know everything on pathogenesis and on uh, immune responses. So for me, what they do now with the vaccination is, yeah, they will... Uh, I can predict already that will, of course, work. It will protect your lungs, but it will not protect your nose. So you will still have replication in the nose, still have, uh, you know, uh, problems with the, you know, loss of smell or taste. So this will still happen because you, you cannot protect by uh, injections. If you inject your vaccine, you will uh, induce IgGs. Sometimes uh, your cytotox T uh, lymphocytes you will stimulate, but you will not induce a local immunity in your nose. So this will stay open. And also uh, all the, the people that have been vaccinated can still be a kind of a, 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 a chain in the transmission of, of the virus. So uh, this virus is not gonna, because everybody yeah. believes that if you start to vaccinate that you will you know, kick out the virus. That's not true. So you will, it will, of course, you will, bring it down but it will not be gone so because you, you, the, the the vaccinated people will still allow to you know let the virus circulate and mm -hmm. that's an important one so this is a from a very point of view already but the, they don't listen so uh, so um, you know even when you talk to them they, they just you know it's just like that humans are totally different from animals for me uh, you know i put a human just beside a cat and a dog and, and a pig and then even my, my shrimp so, uh, you know, you look to those, let's say, a species uh, X, just like with the other animals, and I don't see something special. And that's why uh, sometimes I think, you know, I've said that they don't have to be scared of, of the vaccine uh, effic efficacy, but they don't believe it, you know. So uh, sometimes they should listen also to, uh, to a vet. Uh, because indeed we have, you know, a lot of experience. And, uh, but but did, did, this didn't get in, uh, in the news. Also, the, the, the journalists, you know, if you talk to them and they hear that you're a veterinarian, then that's already kind of a, yeah, okay, 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 you, you know something about animals, but you're not the same virologist as a human virologist. So uh, sometimes I'm not very happy with their, uh, with their attitude, but okay, we will not change the world uh, with, with COVID-19. You know? It struck me when, when I heard in the UK, one of the, the uh, first page, uh, front page news was that they found now this fantastic treatment against COVID, which is called dexamethasone. And I thought, 
<laughs> Come on, we are treating cats with yeah. coronavirus infections for years, and we, we yeah. know that the, the, the use of corticosteroids is of considerable benefit. And just yeah, that, course, that yeah. showed me that maybe sort of on the, the, the one health idea is just not working as yeah. it should. I mean, yeah, well. and, yeah. It's worrying if, if our human colleagues sort of only came across this sort of after uh, uh, yes. trying, testing, yes. trying, failing. Yes. So, so, I mean, we, we, we possibly would have been in earlier with, for example, that point. But then, as you said, I mean, it's sometimes what journalists make out of it. I'm pretty sure that, that uh, human colleagues sort of did, uh, were aware of it and, and then tried it for a while, but then after after time found actually that the that the use of corticosteroids is helpful in these patients. Yeah, well, a lot of things went by trial and error, you know. So, uh, um, and I have to say that corticosteroids uh, had always a kind of a negative and and a negative vibe, you know. Uh, uh, don't use corticosteroids because they always think on uh, you know the negative impact on on immune responses. But in an acute phase, if you have an overreactive uh, Im immune response, then you have to cool it down, and, and corticosteroids are very good in that. So uh, mm -hmm. I think this is the only... So you know that uh, what is happening is a kind of an overreactive uh, immunity. So if you can cool it down with your uh, corticosteroids, then, then you do well, and that's what they see now with their patients. Uh, so it's very... I would call it a very simple uh, you know, thing. Uh, there's nothing special on it, but it's it's working well. So the let's say if you look now to the the number of infections, and uh, then uh, let's say the the the, the number of uh, deaths, the, the the ratio is 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 changed uh, compared with the first one. So I think they're doing well now at this moment. So the treatment uh, got got better at this moment. Yeah. With with now vaccines on the horizon and uh, uh, better treatment success, for example, with monoclonal antibodies, mm -hmm. steroids, um, uh, uh, other medication that that are, is now used in in, in trial, um, I think it is foreseeable that at some point we will come uh, in the hopefully near future we will come in a position to to manage this pandemic. But what do you think for us as a profession, but also as society as a whole, what are the long-term effects of this? Will there be a new thinking when it comes to virus infections, pandemics, prevention of pandemics, or mm -hmm. will we pretty much go completely back to normal, maybe yeah. end up with a once a year coronavirus vaccination in the same way as the um, uh, influenza vaccination. Yeah. What's your outlook? What do you think? Where will we go? Well, personally, I think uh, that this thing, you know, first we should have a kind of a population immunity for the lungs because that's the disease. Uh, so if we have, especially the elder people, if we can get their IgG induction, so the immunoglobulin, uh, the neutralizing antibodies, if, if we can get them in those elder population, then I think we, we will get, uh, I will not say get rid, but, but reduce, let's say, the, the, the disease that we see in those elder people. I think that's a very important one. The younger people, uh, uh, they have just a, a little bit fever for a few days, but that's it. So I think when we, we can control the elder population, then I think the, the, the virus, of course, will always come, infect young, young individuals, but we will not see the, let's say, disease in those young individuals. And that's how the thing will, will get to a high level of population immunity. And then uh, the virus will have problems, you know. So the only thing it can do, it will, uh, let's say, circulate in young, young kids. I would call it, uh, you know, at school. There will you, you will have your circulations. And then, of course, you're immune, especially for the, the lung pathology. And then, uh, you know, we, we don't have, let's say, the, the, the drift and the shifts that we have with, 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 with the influenza. So we don't have that with the corona at this moment. So normally, I predict that we will have uh, common colds caused by um, SARS-CoV-2 in young kids, and that will give an immunity for life. Uh, of course, not for protecting them against replication, but for, for pr protecting them against uh, you know, very uh, uh, you know, uh, devastating infections of the lungs. So um, the virus will stay, but I think the impact will go down extremely, uh, extremely fast. So I think... This is what we can expect. 
a very important thing to to tell is that we will not be learned by by this this thing you know th this is a pandemic and will be the people are ready at this moment to jump in a plane and to go wherever as soon as they got vaccinated so people they will this is not a lesson for people you know so people um and and they always in talk about you know the um intensive uh you know uh agriculture you know the the uh, swine industry and whatsoever they always blame uh, those people but i can tell you if you have a pig and you want to send it to china you cannot send a pig as such like we go to china you cannot go to china with a pig like that you should have a full certificate list eh? it should be free of i don't know what a vet should have tested it it should be free of symptoms then you can get it on the plane but if it gets in china it gets in quarantine they will look to that for for weeks it should not show a uh, uh, disease uh, it should also be tested again and it will be rescreened again and, and so on and so on so a pig behaves better than a human being when uh, it concerns uh, you know uh, playing the global trotter so we we should really uh, think what we're doing so we're 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 playing a very dangerous game we're just jumping on every plane and uh, traveling uh, taking a, a plane like like you take a bus nowadays uh, at a very cheap cheap level uh, at the meantime we're destroying our total globe uh, so we really have to rethink what we're doing and and it's really urgent you know so this is we cannot we, we cannot con continue like this and this is a virus of, of course you can say sars cov 2 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. but it can be worse huh? so uh, this is this is a virus but but this is not you know I, i'm a vet so i know what if you look to feline infectious peritonitis are this is a coronavirus killing one to five percent of the cats this is th th this is a killer so uh, mm -hmm. let's say um yeah uh, i think the people do not realize that uh, there should in the in, in in the future a change of of behavior concerning traveling all over the world uh, without a health uh, certificate i'm convinced in the future there will be a kind of a, a necessary certificate just to run over the, the the world of course quarantine that will be difficult of course but uh, but but running you know even when you're ill you just you can you can take a plane nobody will, nobody will take you out of a plane because you're coughing you know so the, and and i can tell you if if somebody has an infection on the plane uh, it's not good you know so so i think people should you know consider and they, there too they should think on what we do uh, with with animals you know because with anim this is fully you know uh, certified everything is fully controlled and we should learn out of that of course then the next thing is uh, you know economy tourism and and so on and so on and so on so money first as usual so i'm i'm i'm, I'm scared that nothing will change uh, so and everybody will be so full of the fact that we were controlling it in a, such a fast way but i tell you this is a stupid virus so if it would be a, a more complex virus this will be if you talk about pers prsv in, in pigs or africa even worse african swine fever if you would have those those viruses this is this is that's that's and these are viruses that are just heading for for the immune cells like uh, macrophages and there is no uh, i i don't believe it's very easy to make a vaccine against african swine fever virus so this is if it would be a virus like that then uh, then we're really in trouble you know um yeah okay hans thank you so much for talking to me yeah. um if any one of our viewers has any further questions or would like to send comments, you can email us on thatchat at ficava.org and obviously you can comment uh, on our social media sites. And thank you very much again to, uh, to uh, um, uh, Ghent uh, University and uh, next week I will have another person I would like to chat with so stay tuned and uh, I welcome back to the next Fikava Vet Chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm.